This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. And welcome to the show. Honored to have you on. You have uh, had some success in a, in a number of areas that I know, uh, you know, we're going to bring out some of those skill sets that you have that have helped you build success in a, in a number of areas that's going to help the listeners today. Uh, so welcome. Thank you, Whitney, for having me on the show. Yeah, honored to meet you and to have you on. Uh, you know, I know you are the founder of Resimply, and I thought it'd help the listeners to know a little bit about what that is, because uh, we're going to dive into some of the skill sets that have helped you build that business and maybe even some of the things within that uh, that could help the listeners also. Yeah, absolutely. So Resimply is an all-in-one software for real estate investors. So the way we like to look at it is a successful real estate investors will have four pillars to their business. They would have data, marketing, sales, and operations. And that's kind of what we built with Resimply. You can use the data management side of it. Then you can use it for marketing, like you're you know, sending out direct mail, calling websites. And then on the sales side, you can use it for as a CRM, calling, texting, sending emails. And the, on the operation side, you can use it for your vendor management, for your uh, bookkeeping and accounting side of it. You know, as we as our businesses grow, we are uh, like each of those pieces, we're growing in different ways. You know, it's interesting to be able to have all that in one platform because it's uh, it's it's like we're constantly piecing together things to do that those things individually, right? Yeah, uh, and it's and it's hard for them to communicate uh, and often needed, right? For them to be able to, or at least to have it all in one place. Uh, and so that's that's really neat. Uh, and so you know. You know, we were talking about beforehand a little bit the, you know, the marketing, data tracking. Obviously, that's a, a big part of the, you know, what the software can do as well. Um, but let's dive into that uh, a little bit. I know you mentioned like helping through the software, helping people find deals, right? Or figuring out, uh, you know, the data and the sales piece component. I guess elaborate on some of that uh, a little bit and we'll dive in. Absolutely. So on the data side, I would say the the most important like functionality that we offer is uh, let's say if you're a real estate investor and you're looking to reach a list of owners through some direct to seller marketing, let's say direct mail, you would get your list from, let's say county, you would go to public source to get the list, or you would get it from any other source that you have, um, that you're using in your business. Now, what happens is there's going to be some overlap in all those different lists that you're getting. So one of the functionality that we offer is called list stacking, for example. It stacks all your lists and it tells you which records appear in uh, each of the record, how many lists that they appear in. So let's say if you get a list from a public source, you know, these are people that are behind on taxes, behind on mortgage payments. So each list, think of it as a motivation point that the seller has. So you get people that are behind on taxes, people that are behind on their mortgage payment, that's one list. The other would be some other distress point, like their property is in good condition, right? Or they have, they're going through a, uh, a divorce or some other financial personal difficulty. That would be another motivation point. So let's say you take these two lists, put it in list stacking. Now we'll give you, let's say a thousand records in each list. You put it in list stacking and it tells you 500 records between the two lists are common. So they are behind on their taxes, behind on mortgage, and they're also going through a divorce, for example. So if you had limited budget, or if you wanted to be very targeted with your marketing, you would want to go after the 500 people before you go after the entire list. Because those 500 people have multiple motivation points rather than just one motivation point. So that's the, that's the most important piece on the data side is to know, identify the highly motivated sellers that you have in your business that you should be going after. So rather than doing marketing to each of those lists, thousand and thousand separately, and then you, you know, sending, let's say 2000 mail pieces. Now you're only sending 1500 because you have 500 overlap between the two lists and those 500, you may want to send uh, a different mail piece because they appear on multiple, uh, they have multiple distress lists that you have. So that's, I would say that's the most important part of like the data management side. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, it's it's so much more efficient to be able to narrow it down to the 500 than it is to send oh, 5,000, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I mean, imagine like doing this on a much larger scale, you know, instead of like 
thousand thousand, let's add like a couple of, you know, zeros after, let's say you have hundred thousand records, right? Or 10,000 records, hundred thousand records. Now imagine doing this, you don't want to send it to the entire list that you have. If you want to target now, instead of like 500, you have, you know, 5,000, 50,000 records that you're going after. Yeah. What types of properties would you say this works best for? Uh, I mean, we have we have companies that are doing primarily single family, but it also works for multifamily, storage units. You have mobile home parks. The important thing is to identify the people that have high motivation to sell, right? So that's that's kind of what you want to start out with. You want to start out with people that maybe have some sort of motivation to sell their property. You know, maybe uh, again, there there's some financial difficulty. They have some personal. Uh, you know, distress like bankruptcy, divorce. It works for all businesses. The fundamentals stay the same. You want to identify the distress point and then go after the highly motivated sellers. Yeah, no doubt about it. What, what uh, are you thinking through even the uh, the data component for uh, like commercial real estate specifically? You know, what kind of data are, are you know, you're going to be focused on in, in that sphere versus say single family? I mean, we don't we don't provide any data on uh, through Resimply. So our Resimply starts on once you have your data from you know other sources that you have. Okay. So once you have your data, because that's that's one com uh, component that all investors are doing all different sources to get their data. But once you have your data, that you can put it in Resimply and then start from there. But once you have that, you know, you want to identify the same thing. Like on a single family, you're looking at. You know, you, you want to go after people that have some equity in their property. If it's a hundred thousand dollar house and the seller has a loan of hundred thousand dollars on the property, you may not want to go after that. So you want to look at the same thing on the the commercial side of it. On the commercial side, what you may have it someone who has, let's say, their interest rate is going to adjust soon. Right, they're already very highly leveraged, and now their interest rate is going to adjust, and their mortgage payment is going to the loan payment is going to go up on uh, up on that the asset that they have. You may want to go after that because they may not be able to afford. You know, they may have bought at the the peak of the market with an interest rate uh, low interest rate, and that's how the asset made sense. But now the interest rate is going to go up. It won't make sense. It's not going to be a cash flowing property. That's where you could come in and uh, go after the investor, the, the property. Speak uh, to the, say, the marketing and sales component, or like what happens then or what you, you know, you advise to, to take it, you know, best advantage of those 500 or so. Yeah, I mean, depending on the asset type you have, right? I mean, if you're going after single family owners, then it's, you know, you have, you can do direct mail, you can do cold calling, you can do texting, you can do radio ads, TV ads. But if you're going after, as you're going after more expensive, higher priced assets, you know, generally it's safe to say those investors, those owners would be a little bit more sophisticated. So you may not want to cold call them or send them a, te a text message. What we've noticed, the companies that are using our platform to go after commercial properties or multifamily properties or mobile home parks, they're putting, spending a little bit more money in the marketing. For example, if they if they have a list of multifamily apartments, rather than sending them a postcard, it's like 50 cent postcard, maybe send them like a certified letter, maybe send them a FedEx envelope, maybe send them a UPS envelope. So you know your mail gets delivered and it shows you a little more intent than you know sending a 50 cent postcard. So that's what you would want to do. I mean, you could also cold call, but... You want to have a very targeted list. You don't want to have a virtual assistant making the cold call. This is this is something you want to be calling because you would have a smaller list, very targeted list. It's a highly priced asset. It's not a hundred thousand dollar house. It's a millions of dollars worth of property. So in that case, you would want to get involved. You know, call the targeted list of people. But I would say typically what we notice is it's the direct mail a good quality direct mail piece that tends to work well, right? If it's a, if you have a list of, let's say 50 assets that you've identified, maybe, you know, send all of them a FedEx envelope, a UPS envelope, you know, every single one of them is going to get open. Uh, how many times you've received a FedEx envelope and not open it, right? So that's, that's the kind of thought you want to put into it. Not very often, maybe not ever, right? Exactly, exactly. So those are the kind of things you want to think into with the marketing for, as you go up on the, asset class that you're going after, 
It's the marketing piece that you want to start tweaking in your business. The fundamentals will be the same, you know, on who's going to sell. They're going to have the, at the end of the day, someone who wants to sell, they have some motivation, some need financial, personal, but how you reach out to them, that's going to be different. Like the marketing channels that you uh, reach out to them, it's going to be different. You know, it's, it's going to be very rare where you have an owner of a 300 million uh, apartment complex going to Google and say, how do I sell my property fast? That will happen a lot on the single family, but it's not going to happen often or ever on the you know commercial or multifamily property. So you want to reach out to them. And I would say, if you are not sure which one to start with, I would say direct mail would be the best one to start out with. A good quality direct mail piece. No doubt about it. Speak to the maybe the tracking component after that. Uh, you know, or you know, you've sent out a, a bunch right of, of letters. You know, and how do you track that afterwards? How do you know what's happening? Or you know, I don't know. I'm sure some people respond and aren't happy probably with your your letter. You know, or, or maybe maybe they are. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. So what, one very important piece of marketing is, you know, you're sending out marketing to so, you know which one is actually working. So imagine you have a list of owners, like going back to our original example of, you know, we had thousand people on, let's say a list of tax delinquent owners, and we have another thousand people on, you know, going through bankruptcy. Let's just take that example. If you were not tracking that separately, what you would do is you would send you would send the same mail piece to both the list. Let's say if there's no overlap, just for this example, let's say there's no overlap, you send thousand mail pieces to people that are behind on taxes, thousand mail pieces to people that are going through bankruptcy. Okay. So you send out 2000 pieces of mail, you get people calling back and let's just say, just for this example, to keep it simple, you end up spending $2,000. Okay. You get a seller to call back, you end up buying the property and let's say you make $10,000 on it, okay? And you look at your numbers and you're like, this is fantastic. I spent $2,000 and I made $10,000. So I have five X return on my investment. So every dollar that I put in, I got five X back. Let's say you can repeat it. Now the question would be, was it the tax delinquent list that made you money or was it the bankruptcy list? Like, did you really have to spend $2,000 to make 10,000 or could you have just mailed to the bankruptcy list and spent only $1,000 and made the same $10,000? So instead of actually having 10X on your market, uh, instead of having 10X on your marketing, you're only getting 5X because you're, you're not being efficient with your marketing. You're not tracking it properly. You're not tracking it con correctly on how you should be tracking. So I think that's where we noticed a lot of inefficiencies in how the investors are running their business. Generally speaking, the biggest expense the investors have on their PL is marketing. And if you can be efficient with your marketing, if you can go from, let's say, 5x to 6x, 7x, or 10x on your on your marketing spend, imagine all of that money is going right into your net profit. It's actually going to be higher because as you get more efficient in your marketing, now you need less salespeople because previously you were sending 2,000 mail pieces. Now you're sending only 1,000 mail pieces. So you need half the staff that you needed previously. So imagine if you add a couple of zeros to these numbers, like what a huge difference that would make. Instead of spending you know, 2,000 and making 10,000, right? Let's say you add a zero. You're spending 20,000 making 100,000. You're spending... 200,000, you know, and making a million dollars. So that's where you start gaining a lot of efficiency in your business is by tracking your marketing spend on what's working and what's not working in your marketing. Speak to, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, you know, how you've scaled, give us some timelines or, or maybe how you've scaled the business and we'll jump into some of the specifics uh, on how you've been successful at doing that. Yeah. So I started the company in 2000, end of 17, uh, I started the company, hired a couple of developers overseas just to create a product for myself. And after about a year, year and a half, I realized that I wasn't very clear with my expectations with the team members that I had on what I needed. So the first year and a half was a complete waste on, you know, things that we were trying to do. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say complete base, but it was a good good education that I got on, you know, how I need to manage the team members. 
So then I hired, uh, you know, I mean the same, uh, then I hired a new team and I was very clear about exactly what I wanted uh, from the, you know, the end result. And I was more involved. We had a shorter feedback loop rather than giving something to my team and saying, hey, go create this, come back six months later and show me what you have. It was like weekly check-ins. Hey, let's just see what you have done. Let's just make sure we're like staying on the right path on what needs to be developed. So that was the important thing. And the most important thing in scaling business for us have been having the right people in the right seat and really knowing what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are. And I personally, I have the mindset that I would rather double down on my strength because I'm going to have the more, I can leverage that better versus working on my weaknesses. So I would rather hire someone on my team who can complement me with their skills and help me on the weaker side. And I can go double down on the strength side of it. Another thing is realizing once you've found someone who's really good at what they do, give them give them the full freedom to do whatever they want to do. Like have the KPIs to check in with them just to make sure everything is going correctly. But don't micromanage. If you have someone who's really good at marketing, give them the freedom to be creative with it, right? As long as they're not going to make a decision that's going to completely bankrupt you or like take your company down, it's okay to test out a few things. Some of, you know, most of them are going to fail, but some are going to work. The ones that are going to work are going to more than make up for the, the ones that failed, the things that you tried. Same thing on on the development side, you know, same thing on the, the customer support side. If you know, you know, people on your customer support, like ask them for ideas rather than saying, hey, I want you to do this. Ask them, okay, what would you, if you were a customer of ours, what would need to happen from us for it to make it like an absolute five-star experience for them? It doesn't have to be anything big, right? It can be like small little things, like even the, how we're communicating with our our customers, right? It could be the language that we're using, like showing empathy, like small little things are super, super important. And then have weekly check-ins with the team members, like have weekly KPIs just to be able to track the data, right? Like going back, uh, like an example of, if you're looking to lose weight, like the things that you control are going to gym and your diet, and then you just track if the weight is going in the right direction. If not, then the effort that you're putting in, maybe you're not going to the gym enough. Maybe you're going to the gym every day, but you're not doing anything. Or you're going to the gym every day, you're working out, but then you come home and eat McDonald's. So then, then you start tweaking those levers that you have with the hope that the end result that you have, the weight going down, will go in the right direction. So with our team, it's very important that we track, we track the KPIs we hold our team accountable on things that are in our control. It's in our control to absolutely give the best service we can, but the customer may still end up giving us a one star, you know, waiting on it just because there was something else going on. We did everything we possibly could. So those are the things we want to like keep track of, like having the right people in the right seat and then giving them the freedom to just run with it and not micromanage. Yeah, I love that uh, that push there because that can be hard, especially for new business owners, right? Or something that you have spent, say, so much time and money, uh, you know, investing and in making this business operate. And then it's what's well, hard to just turn somebody else loose on a big part of it, right? But, and I know personally, it's, as I've found people who are, say, better at specific skills, right? Hopefully, right? You know, that's the expectation anyway. Uh, in certain parts of the business, I want them to go run with it because they're better at it than I am. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you always want to hire... I mean, it's tough in the beginning, right? When you start a company and when you're scaling it, it's very hard to let go of certain things that you've been doing because you feel like maybe it's your ego saying to you, hey, you're the best at this. Why would, how can somebody else come into your company and do a better job at, at it than you were doing? But you have to realize, you have to be honest to yourself. Is it the best use of my time, right? Let's say, let's say if I'm absolutely amazing at customer support, right? But if I can hire someone overseas for like five to ten dollars an hour, is it the best use of my time? Even though I absolutely am best at it, like you can pass those skills on. You can tell your team 
what they need to do and then just manage through numbers. But then you have to look at, okay, what is the biggest value add to the business that you do? Like, where do you spend your time that gets the business the biggest, the highest ROI? Those are the things I, it's, it's tough in the beginning, but you have to realize, hey, I'm not good at it. Or is it the best use of my time? Like that's, those are the things you have to ask. And once you find someone and they start doing things like, you know, as good as you're doing, or in a lot of cases better than, it's such a fr amazing feeling to have knowing that you don't have to get involved in everything. You just check in with them once a week, have your meeting, make sure everything is moving in the right direction, make some tweaks, give them some ideas, get ideas from them. And then say, all right, let's try it for another week and see how it performs. Speak to the uh, size of your team and maybe where they're located. Yeah, so we have team members in Philippines, Bangladesh, and India, and US. I met with the team in India. I went to India a couple of years ago. That's where I'm from. So I met with the team. But I've never met with my team in the Philippines, never met with my team in Bangladesh, never met with my team in US. So I'm actually going to Philippines, Bangladesh, and India in about six weeks. Just meet my team in Philippines. Uh, Bangladesh and India. So I'm looking forward to it. But we build this amazing culture of team members, all based virtual, but still working together to create something bigger than uh, bigger than every individual. What about your say hiring process for individuals that are all remote like that? You know, speak to that. I get questions. I mean, I've done it a lot myself. Uh, used uh, you know virtual assistants or people from other countries for lots of things, and usually specialized skills. Right, you find them because they have a skill set that I need on the team. Um, but you know, a lot of people are so hesitant to hire somebody that they can't physically see, right? Uh, you know, so how have you navigated that? Yeah, hey, it's definitely tough. I think one thing, one thing we've realized is, I mean, if you need someone for a very highly skilled job, let's say a video editor, then you want to make sure they have the right skill for it. And if you need someone for one off, then you want to make sure you hire the the most skilled person that you can get. But I'll give an example of, let's say if we're looking to hire someone in our customer support department, for example, right? For me, the important, or any administrative work uh, for that matter, the most important thing for us would be to make sure we hire someone for the, the character, the work ethics, then the skill. If they don't have, if they've never worked in an administrative job, or if they've never worked in, CS position. That's that's okay. That's a skill that we can teach someone uh, develop, right? But if someone doesn't have good work ethics, if someone doesn't have the right character, there's no training I can have them take. If someone doesn't like showing up on time, you know, they clock out before they're, you know, let's say if they're working nine to five, they come in at 10, they clock out at four. Like it just, it just, they don't have the motivation. There's no training that I can send them to, or they're stealing money from the company, right? I mean, in a way, if they're not showing up on time and leaving early, they're kind of stealing money from the company. There's no training I can send them and say, hey, can you please go take this training and learn to be more honest, right? I mean, there's there's no training like that. Right. But if I have someone who's super motivated, you know, they want to learn, I can say, hey, can you go take this training on how to be better as customer support? I'll give you another example. Like I, I also have a house flipping business. And I have my project manager now, uh, Claudia. She's been with me for six or seven years, maybe longer. Uh, she lives in California. We flip houses in Indiana. I hired her as a personal assistant in the beginning. Super, super hardworking person. Always showed up on time. Always willing to, hey, Sharad, what else can I do? What else can I do? And then I started giving her more responsibilities. And she started running. You just kept running with it. And that's, that's what I look for in people as, are they willing to learn? Are they willing to work hard? Do they have the right work ethics? And that's, if they have that, skill can be trained for, but not the the work ethics. So that's that's what we look for anytime we hire anybody in customer support or any administrative job, is just making sure that they have the right work ethics. Is she still your personal assistant or or have you had to hire no, her to fill that? Oh, she's she's grown way beyond that yeah. position. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she's she's project manager. She manages my business. Uh, she gets percentage of the profit just by she didn't have any of the skill. All she was a highly motivated person, super organized, and just she wanted to learn. She wanted to work hard, 
And I just kept giving her more opportunities, more opportunities. And with that came, you know, higher uh, income potential. And then she just kept running with it. Yeah, love that. Uh, it's It's been hard for me when I have a really good assistant to uh, like, I like to let them move on because it, man, it's, it's such a valuable role to me to be a really good, you know, my right hand. Right. Uh, and so, Absolutely. Uh, but that's, that's so crucial when, when they're that skilled and that motivated to let them thrive. Right. And give them that opportunity. Love that. Um, you know, you spoke to hiring for character. I could not agree with you more over skills. Uh, and uh, how do you, what's a way that maybe you judge character to some degree when you're going through the hiring process? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a tough one. I mean, that's when you have to use a little bit of your gut, you know, how a person shows up to the interview. I wish there were some questions we can ask and say, hey, you know, and then we can expect them to give honest answer. Hey, how hardworking are you on a scale of one to 10? You know, uh, will you show up on time every day? I mean, on interview, the person that shows up, it's going to be a different person, but you can, you know, you can tell for the most part, like I'll give you an example, like the head of our um, customer support, like Ted, he's based in, uh, he just moved to Colorado, he was in Las Vegas. So we interviewed a few candidates and after the after the interview, he sent us like a, a five page long email with a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day plan. We didn't ask for it. He took the time to spend it, you know, to send that to us. like. He was like really committed and it just, it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, nobody else did it, you know, like um, a lot of the candidates don't even send a thank you email and that's a big no, no for us. Right. Um, another team member that we have, Shanae, uh, she's our head of our affiliate management. She's based in California. So again, same thing. We interviewed her. She showed up highly motivated. She had, done a lot of research on the company. That's another thing you look for is if the position that they're interviewing, have they already done a research or they're just showing up and asking you questions that they should already know answers to based on um, the job the job application or the, the, the job uh, advertisement that we had. If they're asking, hey, what do you guys do? I'm like, come on, you didn't even, you didn't even like have time to go research on our company. What do we do? So Shanae showed up to the interview knowing everything about the company, and her start date was, so we hired her. And then a week or two before the start date, she started emailing, hey, can I set up a couple of meetings with you? Because when I want to come in, you know, I want to have some of the administrative like work already taken care of. I want to know, you know, I just want to come in day one, just be starting. Like that, nothing makes you happier than knowing that you have someone who's committed to, to being successful as much as you want them to be. And they're like more committed to, being successful than you're hoping them to be. So like even the head of our marketing, he's he's from Bangladesh. He has been with me since pretty much early days, like since 2018, or I hired him as like just to help me with some VA task at like three or four dollars an hour. He's making a lot more money than that, but absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. Like it's it's something that I give him anything, he never says no. I give him it's like, okay, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. Same thing on uh, the head of our tech team, like uh, Sandeep. He's been with me for since the beginning. Like, just I was working a couple of different teams, with the development teams in the beginning. And Sandeep, I would give anything. I would say, hey, can you? Do Even if he didn't know, he's like, yeah, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. He'll figure out. If he didn't know an answer, he'll figure out where to find an answer and get that done. Same thing on our CS team. You give our team something. They'll come up with ideas on like, hey, how can we improve uh, improve this? And they challenge me. And I that's one thing I tell my team is, hey, challenge me on something. If I'm not, if don't do it just because I'm asking you to do it, just push back and say, it doesn't make sense or we can do this in a better way like this. So that, that makes a huge difference. Like just knowing, and I'm giving you a very long answer, but just, you know, knowing that if someone challenges you and then, and they, they have some reasons to challenge you and you give them something and they're like, okay, yeah, I'll get it. And even if they don't know the answer, they just say, I'll, I'll take care of it. And then showing up on the interview, they've done their research um, before they show up on the interview, they're asking you the right question and you just seem very engaged in the interview. Like they really want the job. And after you've done the interview, if you get a thank you email from them, I think those are the things that um, goes a long way. 
but oh, absolutely. Uh, but Shred, uh, pleasure to meet you and and to have you on the show. Uh, grateful for your time, the way you've given back to us, and even diving into uh, building a scalable business and and really scaling, uh, even with many team members from all over the world. Um, you know, from the importance of culture to the way you communicate to hiring for character over skills. Uh, I mean, so many great tips. Uh, that anybody that's looking to scale better keep in mind. That's for sure. Uh, Shred, tell the listeners again how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Sure. Yeah, so they can get in touch with me through email, sharad at resimply.com. So S-H-A-R-A-D at R-E-S-I-M-P-L-I.com. And if they want to learn a little bit more about the Simply, they can go to R-E-S-I-M-P-L-I.com. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.